The following episode contains approximately 815 spoilers for all seasons and episodes of Lost. You've been warned. Welcome back to another episode of Lost the Plot. It's the show where two Irish lads talk a load of poppycock about ABC's hit mid aughts TV series Lost. My name is Dave. I'm your usual host. With me, as always, is, uh, as he is half the time, a very sick uh, co-host. It's Ado. How's it going, Ado? I'm telling you, man flu is a real thing, buddy. I don't care what anyone fucking says. Man flu is real and it has hit me hard i want someone to go back and track your like how many episodes you've been sick for because it has been quite a few now like i've said it before i'll say it again this podcast is taking a toll on your health i listen i don't know if it's the podcast or whether or not i was like had like a really bad immune system as a baby probably still do who knows but you know what was amazing like during the entire period of the covid pandemic I didn't get sick once. And I think a lot of us had that experience that for like the better part of two years, I forgot what it was like to be sick. (laughs) And now every time I get sick, it's like worse than ever. Yeah. Do you think like your immune system sort of got too big for its boots during that time? It got too fucking lazy. It didn't know how to work. Nobody wants to work anymore. Yeah, no, my immune system has has like I've gold starred this pandemic, to my knowledge. I have yet to have covid. Neither has my dad or my brother, so I suspect uh, an immunity on his side, maybe. Um, like, my dad's wife had it, and he still didn't get it. But I never get sick anyway. I've, I've always said it. I have the immune system of a god. Now, I have been called out for saying that before because I got sick shortly afterwards. <laughs> because uh-huh. I said on the podcast, and, and then Ryan called me out when I called in sick to work, <laughs> like, a week later. But for the most part, knock on wood, very uh, very robust immune system on your boy. You're, you're not afraid of jinxing that. No, like as soon as you hang up this call now, you're just going to get a little tickle in the back of the throat. No? Yeah, I mean, maybe. Maybe it's catching through the mic. No, I've been I've been tempted faith for years bragging about that. So I you know, yeah. bring it on, I say. Maybe, maybe I need to be sick more. Maybe it's uh, humbling. You know, maybe I need more life experience. No, trust me. Way. You really do not need to be sick anymore. It, it This is not fun. Two out of ten. Do not recommend. <laughs> The only time I've been bed bound the last few years has been, uh, well, actually, yeah, there was that when I got back from Croatia, I was sick as fuck. Uh, that was during the run of this podcast. I think I spoke about it then. And then also my uh, the side effects from my second and third vaccines were second was much worse, but third was still not great. I, st- I still remember the, the first time I had COVID. And I say the first time I have a feeling I had COVID the sec- a second time, but I don't remember. Mm-hmm. I don't remember. It's just my brain is telling me I did. But I don't remember if I did. Actually, do you know what? No, I don't think I actually did because that would have involved <laughs> having to fucking, you know, like lock down for 10 days and all that shit as, as people do. Although that's not really a requirement anymore here. I don't think. Well, it yeah. is, but it's not enforced. Yeah, people have uh, largely stopped giving a shit. How are you, man? How have you been otherwise? Like any anything going on this week or, or has sickness sort of engulfed your entire uh... schedule? Completely. I've just been head down, shutting out the entire world, ignoring all of my text messages the last couple of days while I've been dribbly and snotty and coffee and fucking everything here. Uh, it's, it's, it's been pretty bad, but I had absolutely no medication in the house. Anything. No, like I've got a medicine drawer. Uh, some people have a cabinet. I have a drawer. That's just the way it works. Don't judge me. And when I started, you know, getting the man flu, I realized I had to go to the pharmacy, but I decided, you know what? We learned some lessons during COVID and I'm going to employ those lessons. Now, I clearly have some sort of a virus and it is clearly an infectious one, right? Oh, I got that virus. That virus. So what I did was because I was like, oh man, the nose was running like a tap. There was no stopping it. What I did was I got two big pieces of tissue and wedged them up into my nose. And then I put on a face mask 
to hold the tissue in place. <laughs> so when I went to the pharmacy, I kept my hands in my pocket, face mask on, and my voice was even muffled because it was all this like tissue paper <laughs> pushing it out. You're walking in there like Darth MacGyver. I'm walking in there like patient zero. <laughs> you, like you could just tell as soon as I went up to the counter, there was like four members of staff. They all just stopped what they were doing and they were all just looking at me. Mm-hmm. And it didn't help that I was like, yeah, can I get some Lemsip? <laughs> they were probably like, is there a new pandemic we don't know about? <laughs> can I get some uh, Exputex? Can I get some of the Ultravit? Can I get like this and that and that? Like all the shit you need just when you have like a common cold or a flu or whatever. It gives me vibes of like the old West where you would go into a general store and they would rather than like peruse the aisles, they would just put a paper bag on the counter and you'd tell them what you need, you know? Oh, give me, uh, give me some shoe shan and uh, and they had everything. Yeah, yeah, the well, it was a general store, you know. They don't, they, they didn't get that name for nothing. Yeah, exactly. You could get everything. You could get your vegetables. You could get magazines. You could get pop if you wanted it. <laughs> I don't want pop. God damn it! I'm a Dapper Dan <laughs> man. Man, we still quoting that movie fucking years on. That's a great movie. I rewatched it for the first time, probably since uh, where, where, for those uninitiated, we're referring to a brother where I've now the uh, Coen Brothers movie. We watched that in college with our mate Bren and proceeded to quote it every day for the rest of our. Skin. Has there been a movie that we watched in college that ended up being more quotable? Like, holy fuck. <laughs> yeah, but I rewatched it. I think I probably I rewatched it a couple of months ago for the first time since college, probably. Uh, oh, really? Also. It's a good one. Yeah. I, I haven't watched it since, and I still remember so much of it. Well, Ada, me and the fans, both of them, as you'd say, we really appreciate you, you turning up today to record. Are you ready to get on with it? No, I want to mention something really quick, right? We did a <laughs> quiet announcement. And I say quiet because we didn't really put it on social media. We just didn't mention it in the middle of last week's episode. Or no, it was like several weeks ago. We haven't talked about the merch store at all. Yeah, it is. There. We we talked about it the first couple episodes of the season, I think, because that's when we were talking about it. And then, I don't know, IRL listeners, our first episode of season two came out yesterday at the time of recording. We're recording this on the 13th of October. So suddenly our merch store is back in our minds. And yeah, we've got a merch store. The link is in the bio of this episode. I don't think I could rhyme it off because it's quite a long one, right? Yeah, it's it's on Redbubble. If you search Lost the Plot Lads on Redbubble, you'll find us. Hit the go. link that's in our link tree and it'll bring you directly to our Redbubble shop. And viewers, listeners, whatever the fuck y'all are, wherever you are, you might have noticed there's a new piece of artwork. And once Hell again, yes. that is by the wonderful Jimmy Purcell. Now, I know we mentioned Jimmy all the time in our credits at the very end, but I feel he does not get enough of a sh- shout out for nah, all the shit right. he has done. Right. He's a great dude. The dude charges Fuck all for artwork and then gives us full rights to sell merch with it. I'm like, OK, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. So if you are interested, we can. We, you know what? If we on the off chance we sell any merch, we should give Jimmy a little kickback. That was going to happen anyway. Yeah. Uh, so if you want some merch, check the link in the bio. I'll warn you right now. It's fucking expensive. <laughs> OK, do not try and fucking blame us for that. That's no, just red bubble, right? No, that's how that's the nature of the beast. Uh, it's made to sell, though, right? It's, or like, so it doesn't get made until you order it. So it's not like we have stacks and stacks of fucking unused T-shirts sitting in an Indiana Jones esque warehouse. But uh, yeah, I mean, if you want to support us, that would be massively appreciated. Uh, yeah, on the off chance someone does support us, know that the the money made is almost certainly just going to go back into the podcast. Yeah, it's going to help you get like a better camera or some shit like that. (laughs) I need it. Yeah, so so check out Redbubble. Uh, The link is in the description. It should just say, check out Lost the Blood merch here, with here being a hyperlink. I'm over explaining this. You're a big boy or girl or uh, other. You know how to fucking click a link in a bio. All right, Edo. That's out of the way. Thank you for that housekeeping. Are you ready to get into it? Let's fucking do it, man. Let's go. This week, we are covering the other 48 days, which first aired the 16th of November, 2005. Edo, thoughts on that title, The Other 48 Days? It is about as (laughs) self-explanatory as you fucking get. There is no hidden meaning here. It's literally just telling the audience, here's what's been happening. 
with <laughs> other people throughout the entirety of the events you've just seen over the last year and a half. I felt as is my want to do, I would scrape the barrel. Uh, I don't actually have a funny like um, trivia section to like trivia point to end on today like i usually do I, trivia for this episode was surprisingly thin actually but uh here's my barrel scrape other meaning right the other 48 days oh wow Others. it doesn't make sense at all also four and eight are numbers you are getting splinters scraping that barrel <laughs> holy shit this episode was directed by Someone I believe is a newcomer, Eric Lanouville. I don't recognize the name, but I never recognize even the regular <laughs> names because I'm fucking thick. I think he is a newcomer, Eric Lanouville. So shout out to him. Eric, I, got, I did a history on him because I thought he was new. So if he's had one before, Eric, you're getting, you're getting double spotlight here. But uh, he is a TV director, producer, and started off his career as an actor. Oh, no way. I love it when that happens. Yeah. So he's acted in a bunch of small roles, very random stuff. Uh, He was in a movie called The Omega Man in 1971 with one Charlton Heston. Charlton Heston is classic Hollywood actor who I believe became a massive NRA guy, right? Oh, really? Yeah, massive like gun rights. He might even be like fucking co-founder of the NRA or something. He was like a massive guns guy. He also uh, Eric hold on. Newville. Can I can I just say before you move on? I'm not going to spend too long on it. But if you are you familiar with the series uh, on YouTube last week tonight with uh, the British guy? Yeah, John Oliver. John Oliver. I mean, it's on HBO, but yeah, they post clips on YouTube. Just go and watch his segment on the uh, on the NRA. Mm-hmm. Fucking wild. Yeah, yeah. I think I've seen that one. I think he mentions Charlton Heston in that even. Yeah. Uh, but back to our boy Eric Lenouville. He also played in the movie a force of one he played chuck norris's adopted son ah. <laughs> so you know he's tough and he also played dr lamar in an episode of scrubs so he's also directed episodes of quantum leap doogie hauser md gilmore girls prison break it's that word i love Ado. he is a regular journeyman director there we go love it the only other interesting fact I could find on him, I mean, he's an interesting guy, but uh, the only notable one is in 1988, he became the first African-American TV director to film in Russia. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it was for a two-parter for the series Head of the Class. It's an American series, but the episodes were set in Moscow. Uh, so that's our boy. That's Eric Lanouville. Shout out to him. This episode was written by Darleton. Naturally, of course. Yeah. I mean, when you have an episode that is as lore focused as this one, yeah, you gotta you gotta bring the big boys in. You gotta bring the twins in. Yeah, that's that's Damon Lindelof and Carlton Cues, collectively known as Darton, the uh the, the de facto showrunners. Hold on. Speaking of behind the scenes uh fucking TV workers, did we mention our boy Jacino after directing an MCU project? Yeah, I think we talked about this last week. So I watched it two days ago. How was it? Man, it is way better than it had any fucking right to be. I have heard that. Like, like it's uh, especially good for a Marvel property. Like it's like it's got artistic merit is what I've heard. Right. Like he gets it. Like, mm-hmm. And, you know, anyone can direct a movie or an episode of a TV show. Point and shoot. Shot, reverse shot. Your fucking rule of threes. Okay, there's some basic <laughs> shit you can throw in there. But this man gets it, right? Yeah. And he's like, he's not just, you know, fucking directing out of a textbook here. He makes it look as though he's been doing this for a long fucking time. But I suppose he's been watching it done for a long fucking time. He's picked up some tricks. Absolutely. You score. Have you ever seen a, a someone scoring a movie? Have you seen that in action? Like they get the movie in front of them without music and they yeah. put the music to it. Right. So he's probably like just ha- put in his 10,000 hours of pure exposure to the craft, you know? Uh, you'll definitely pick up some things along the way. I'd love to know what Scorsese thinks of this uh, werewolf thing. I tell you what, I tell you what, idea for a bonus episode. Dave, jot this down. You're more organized than I am. Can <laughs> we do a bonus episode sometime where we just talk about Giacchino's movies, Giacchino's okay. projects and shit like that? Because I want to have a discussion on on all the shit Giacchino's done, some of his best music. Because you know me, I love the movie Musicians. Anyway, so yeah, it's written by Darleton, directed by Eric Lenouville, which, by the way, just one more thing on him. Pretty great episode to be given for your first, uh, for your maiden lost voyage, right? Like quite yeah. an important one. Yeah, so fair play to him. Uh, not an easy undertaking, I'd say, because 
you know, this episode is about a completely different set of characters to the one we used to. Um, like, he still got the tone of the show down, but he was probably allowed a, a bit of wiggle room to put his own spin on it as well, considering it is a completely different group of protagonists we're dealing with here. So I thought he handled it wonderfully. Shout out again to Eric. Yeah, absolutely. Well done to him. He did a great job. This episode opens without a previously on Lost. True. It does not have a previously on Lost. Now, I guess it makes up for it later on. Uh, we do get a lot of archive footage later on in the episode. But having said that, we open on a beautiful, tranquil shot of a beach. There is a gorgeous, lovely blue ocean that stretches beyond the horizon. Does it get any more perfect than this, Edo? This is pure paradise we're looking at. Let's, let, how about, let's come with me on a journey. Let's slowly, very slowly, very patiently pan towards that ocean there. Ooh. Do you feel that? The wind is picking up. Yeah, it's getting a bit chilly now. I can hear the wind. What's going on? The wind, yeah, the wind is audibly picking up. Suddenly, bits of plane debris begin falling from the sky, crashing into the ocean. Most notably, the entire tail section of a fucking plane, which wallops against the ocean, creating a massive splash. More small pieces continue to fall until one dramatically hits the camera and we black out. It is loud. It is fast it is chaotic this is terrifying this is a great opening really well done cgi i thought as well like it looks the part yeah uh so we're on a black screen and then words slowly fade in day one immediately establishing that we are going back to the beginning here so i think it doesn't take a genius to realize this is the tale of the oceanic flight this is going to be the story of our tailies told in in segments uh denoting the each day that they happen i.e the other 48 days can i just say how delighted i was when i saw those words day one come up on screen for two reasons first of all it lets us know exactly what happened on each day so that if we were hardcore nerds and we had like a little calendar you know depicting major events on different days we could sync up what's going to happen in this episode with what's been happening to the other guys But also the other reason I was delighted with how fucking organized my notes are going to be for this episode. (laughs) Yeah, I agree. I usually caps lock whenever there's like a flashback or something, just just sort of changes like that. But otherwise, yeah, they're usually pretty messy. It's it's nice and clean this this week with day one. So we begin and we're underwater. And even with the sort of muffled noise that comes with an underwater shot, we can t- we can tell there's just chaos around us, right? So the camera is bobbing. It briefly up, bobs up above the surface of the water to the sounds of screams and carnage before submerging again, before surfacing once more to see the oceanic flight's tail jutting out of the water. And suddenly, Anna Lucia surfaces on screen, confirming we're getting the tailies tail this episode. Yeah, we the audience are trying to keep our heads above the water here. The You know, this episode is straight away putting us in the action to try and get a sense of the chaos and panic that these guys are feeling. Like, it is visceral, the action yeah. that's going on here. And you know what it made me think? The other survivors we've been following since season one, they got to do this straight away on land. They had it on easy mode. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking that. Now, they, I think, obviously, they had it much cushier overall. But when you think about it, that initial scene, the opening of the pilot, that was quite chaotic. They had to deal with fucking, like, fires and explosions and stuff. I don't know that they necessarily had it easy immediately, although they were were in, uh, I don't know, less immediate danger of drowning or whatever. Yeah, true. They also had that one guy sucked into the giant turbine, so yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Exactly. I mean, put it this way, it doesn't matter what section of a plane you're in, if it crashes, it's not going to be a good time. Nah. (laughs) Uh, So Alicia looks around, and it is indeed fucking madness. There's luggage floating everywhere. There's people all around swimming desperately to the shore, clinging onto anything that floats. Uh, You know, the shore, luckily is not too far away. You, you know, it's it's absolutely swimmable for anyone who has survived this initial impact. Anna Lucia joins the group um, uh, that's swimming for us to shore. She reaches the island. And as she does so, we see Mr. Echo emerge as well. And he is dressed pretty sharp. He's rocking a soaking wet suit. Every girl crazy about a sharp dressed man. He is <laughs> looking fine. Yeah, looking very, uh, very handsome, clean shaven. It's not the feral sort of look at Mr. Echo or indeed any of the other survivors that we will come to know later. 
So they're on the shore. However, the situation is not much better here. There are bodies washing up, whether they're unconscious or dead remains to be seen. But Mr. Echo is already in action. He's pulling people to shore. Anna Lucia looks around and she looks shell shocked, you know, for lack of a better word. She's uh, she's horrified. It's probably the, you know, up until the uh, scene later on in the episode, probably the least sort of switched on we've ever seen her. She's just dumbstruck by what the fuck has just happened to her. Yeah, she's normally got, you know, a fucking death grip on her own composure. Mm-hmm. And this is one of the only two times we kind of see her, you know, slip in that regard. It's not for long, though. We, we get a shot of more of the chaos. I think we spot Cindy at one point and Libby at another. By now, Mr. Echo has gone back into the water to help others. And Anna Lucia decides to follow suit. Her temporary days having passed. She jumps into action, dives into the water. Mr. Echo emerges once again with a little boy who's calling for his sister, Emma. Echo follows his calls. He looks back. He sees a young girl floating face down in the water. So he places the young lad down in the shallows, swims back out to the wee lass pulls her ashore, and he lays her down near Ana Lucia, who by now has made it back to the shore as well. She's attending to someone else. We get another shot of the young lad. He's looking concerned, and he's holding a teddy bear. A wee teddy. (laughs) We saw this. If it wasn't last episode, it was the episode before. The others, I guess it was the episode before. The others trundling through the jungle with children in their wake, and one of them was holding this exact teddy bear. Oh, uh, right? yeah, that's where we saw the teddy bear. I was wondering what the significance of this teddy bear was. <laughs> yeah, it definitely lingers on it, I think, to, to imply that it's the same one. Anyway, Anna Lucia tells her patient that she'll be right back. Whoever she's attending to is awake, seems to be relatively okay. She runs over to the girl, and Echo confirms your suspicions, Edo. She's not breathing. Uh, Anna Lucia quickly begins performing CPR while Echo tells the boy to come with him. And the kid drops his bear and does as he's told. Echo assures him, your sister will be fine. And Lucia continues to CPR intensely uh, in law style. You know, she stops short of baiting the shite out of her chest like we usually see. Don't it's you pretty... die on me! <laughs> yeah, yeah. But again, that kid should have some broken ribs. Uh, but finally, the young girl coughs up a lung full of water. Anyway, Anna Lucia looks delighted. She asks the girl if she's okay, and all the girl can reply is, where's my mom? AL says she doesn't know. To which the girl says their mom is supposed to be meeting them in L.A. Anna Lucia takes one more look around at all the chaos, the people screaming for loved ones, and then she tells the girl, we're not there yet. But she promises they'll get her home soon. She looks around again. We get a few final shots of the chaos as the tail of the plane plays a little game of submarine and sinks completely under the water. And we get our title card. Now, here's the thing. Did you notice any weird sounds during that whole scene? Oh, I did. I had it in my uh, in my trivia, but I guess we could say it now. You do hear the sounds of the monster, certainly just before the plane hits the right. I, I'm not imagining that, right? No, no. Yeah, definitely a monster sound there. I thought maybe when it was sinking as well, although that could have been the sound that big hunks of metal make when they sink. I'm not really sure. The trivia just said it was before the, the plane hits the water. It didn't mention when it was sank. I think I heard it twice. Once Obviously, yeah, just as it hit the water, I definitely heard it. But also, at the very end of that scene, we do get a scene of Anna Lucia kind of looking around at the, you know, surrounding mountains and jungle and shit. I'm pretty confident we hear it again there. But there's so much of a of a dissonant cacophony yeah. uh, of sound happening around. It blends in to that uh, tonal landscape. I don't know what else to call it. Audio mm-hmm. landscape. Yeah. This was a fantastic opening scene, by the way. It's essentially like a lower budget version of the opening scene of the pilot. And it worked for me. I thought it was great. The, especially, literally, especially the opening shot, like that everything flying out of the air, breaking the tranquility. I just loved it. It was fantastic. So like I said, we get our title card and then we're back on the beach where Cindy is sitting down and she's looking shooketh, uh, as is everyone. Mr. Echo approaches her with the kids and he asks her to babysit because he has to do something. And Cindy agrees. Echo tells the kids he'll BRB, and he begins to pull bodies from the ocean. We cut to a dude who's complaining about a pain in his leg. And as Libby sort of rolls up the old trouser leg, we see his leg is clearly broken because the bone is like fucking pushing against the inside of his skin. It is. Ooh. Yeah, that looks rough. Uh, I had a similar thing when I broke my arm. Like it wasn't nearly as dramatic or pronounced, but I could see like a little bit of bone sort of. You know, oh, moving my skin out. I've never had broken bones. 
I can't remember if I told the story before, but I uh, did I tell you about breaking both of my bones? I must no. have told you back in the day, but I, I, I broke my arm on the 23rd of December, 2003. And then I broke my hand on the 23rd of December, 2005. There was exactly two years to the day between each broken bone. No fucking way. And I uh, haven't broken one since, apart from maybe the odd toe or something. No, nah, I'm still unofficially indestructible. I had a suspected hairline fracture in my heel back in 2006. Ouch. Yeah, that was literally just from trying to show off in front of a girl by practicing um, martial arts kicks on mahogany wood, which <laughs> pro tip, don't do that. And uh, yeah, I was I could feel that in my ankle, like in my heel for literally years, years. Like if I just hit that heel wrong, it was like, ah, like I could feel. So, yeah, suspected hairline fracture. But the thing about those is you don't do anything with them. They, they just yeah. heal on their own. So, yeah, there, we got this guy with his, you know, clearly broken leg. It's bad, isn't it? He says, it's not so bad, says Libby. And she begins to regale him with the story about the time she broke her leg skiing. She's blabbering on. And Anna Lucia is sitting there as well. She's kind of like beginning to wonder why the fuck Libby's going on about what this. What the fuck is this bitch on about? Yeah. <laughs> and then Libby gets to a certain point in the story. I wish I had written it down, but basically it all comes around to the word BAM. And as she says that, she twists your man's leg back into place and he screams in fucking agony and then passes out. Is it just me or like Libby's bedside manner here is so good. Like she's being so nice to this man and Libby's display of kindness seems to totally baffle Anna Lucia. Like she's (laughs) never seen a person being nice before. The, The look she gives her like, what is this? Is this alien behavior? Well, she is a cop. That's true. A cab motherfucker. <laughs> so Libby splints your man's leg to a stick while Anna Lucia quizzes her on her qualifications. Libby says she did go to med school, but she dropped out. And now she's a clinical psychologist. And then Libby asks Anna Lucia if she's a doctor because she saved the kid's lives. <laughs> and Anna Lucia is like, nah, 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 that ain't me. Suddenly, a man begins to call for help, and he sort of emerges from the, the bush, and, and, he, and he says, someone's alive in the jungle. And Anna Lucia, she jumps into action, and she follows him into the brush, and they run towards a man, screams for help, and they reach this clearing, and the camera pans up to reveal fucking Bernard, and he's still in his chair, and he's stuck in a tree. This has to be, like, one of the worst positions to find yourself. Yeah. I, I would nearly wish to fall and die just so I didn't have to be in that situation <laughs> anymore. But, you know, watching Bernard in this tree got me thinking something. Why is Bernard still in this chair? Yeah. How did he... No, 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 no. Answer that question. Why is he still in this chair? Well, he had his belt on. Now, I'm sure everyone else did as well. No. Here's the thing. If everyone else had their fucking belts on, they'd be stuck to the seats. So everybody who has survived to this point, not a single fucking one of them has been wearing a seatbelt. Shower of bastards. Having said that, if they landed in the water, they might have been on their seats and just unbuckled them. Possibly. Sure. I mean, I'd be unbuckling them pretty quickly if I was underwater. We then, so we pan out a little bit more. We see it's actually a trio of seats and there's a fella in another seat. The one between him and Bernard is free, uh, but this fella, he does not seem to be as lucky as Bernard. He's slumped over. Almost certainly dead. Nah, that motherfucker dead. Uh, so Analysia immediately begins to talk in her de-escalating voice. Like, this sounds like someone who's negotiated with hostages before or something. Or rather... Yeah, now, hold, hold on. We, as rewatching viewers, we know that Analysia was a cop, right? But we know nothing about her backstory yet. Nah. She, like, she's been very coy about revealing that she's a cop. Yeah, but the clues are there. So she tries to de-escalate. She asks Bernard his name. And then she tells him to unbuckle his seatbelt and grab the branch next to him. It's sort of like over to his left and he's got to get over this dead dude to get it. Basically not get over it, but certainly reach over him. Right. Bernard's pretty hysterical. He asks if the guy beside him is dead. And Lucia says, focus, brother, focus. Do as I say. Bernard unbuckles his belt, but he's still unsure about the grabbing the the tree branch. He reckons any sudden movements those chairs are going to go. And Lucia confirms as much. She tells him, sack up because the seats are going to fall. 
And Bernard slowly and unsurely <laughs> grabs the branch with one hand and then the other, and then the seats fall from under him. And if that body wasn't there before, it fucking is now because the seats clatter to the ground. And Bernard made it. He's clinging to the branch for dear life. He looks like a he looks like a chilling koala bear or something. Yeah. It's the next <laughs> bit that gave me a chuckle. Yeah. Well, and Lucia tells him that she's gonna come up to get him. That part. How? <laughs> Fucking how is she gonna go up and sling him over her shoulder? Like Michelle Rodriguez is a very small woman. Yeah, now she's fit as fuck and probably strong. But yeah, she's not like she she's what like 120 pounds wet, same as, as our girl Kate. If even. I mean, Kate look. The way they've been portraying Kate, I don't know about Evangeline Lilly, but from the other works I've seen her in, she's this tall, statuesque, moderately height to tall height, you know, woman. Michelle Rodriguez is really fucking small. She's only like five foot one, five foot two. Really? If you now, I could be totally wrong with that. She could be taller than that. But from everything I've seen her in, like I've seen her in the Fast and Furious movies, and every time she's standing next to someone, it's almost as like she's just refused the offer of being stood on a box for all of her <laughs> scenes. She is so small. I did notice that Mr. Echo towers above her at one scene in this episode. Now, in fairness, uh, Adavale is a tall motherfucker as well. So you've got two extremes there, which, by the mm-hmm. way, shout out to the subreddit r slash same species. It, uh, <laughs> it's a subreddit dedicated to showing people of wildly varying sizes standing next to each other. Yeah, it's a good one. It has slowly been taken over by uh, pornography. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I thought, in fact, when you mentioned it, I was like, the first thought in my head was, isn't that a porn subreddit? Because I must have seen it at some point. It was never it. meant to be. Yeah, but it took a bend, a bend towards NSFW. No, it's, it's, it's based on a scene from The West Wing where there's two characters walking side by side. One's really tall, one's really short, and the tall one just says, I can't believe we're the same species. <laughs> Great subreddit. Anyway, like you say, uh, yeah, she ridiculously tells him she's going to come and get him. And she walks off the camera. And the dude who brought her there, the guy who alerted her to Bernard's plight, he looks pretty impressed. Yeah. So we cut to later on. Things have calmed down some. The survivors sit on the beach. There was no real tension in that scene anyway, because we know that Bernard has plot armor. Yeah. Yeah, it was a little bit dumb, but it does uh, serve a purpose later on in the episode. Oh, yeah. I totally forgot we were fucking talking about that for a sec. I'm like, okay. Sure. So, yeah, things have calmed down some. The survivors are all sitting along the beach. Mr. Echo's walking around with the kids on either hand. Libby's attending to the injured. And the chappy who brought uh, Anna Lucia to Bernard earlier, he's trying to light a fire. Anna Lucia comes up to him and she asks if he couldn't find any matches. No dry ones, he says. But they need to get a signal fire going so they can be found. Oh, we've heard this one before. Yeah, good logic, though. It's still good logic. Absolutely. Anna Lucia asks your man if he's a Boy Scout. And he says he's in the grown up version, which is the Peace Corps. (laughs) And she like, okay, boomers him, (laughs) which is a surprise to me. She's like, she expresses surprise that the Peace Corps is still a thing, which is that like an old reference? The Peace Corps? Aren't they still a thing? I don't know. Why would they go? I know nothing about them. Yeah, me neither. I probably should have done some research, but there you go. Then she asks him his name, and he says his name is Goodwin. Dun, dun, dun. We have heard this name before. We know that it belongs to a dead body in the jungle in our quote-unquote present day of Lost. Uh, I couldn't remember exactly how much we know about him, because I know that Jin and Mr. Echo stumble across him, right? But what was did Mr. Echo imply that he was... Uh, Shady, or did I he... don't know how smart it is for this episode to reveal Goodwin's name right at the beginning because now we know mm, he's fucking I, shady. I, I have a feeling that it, that they didn't reveal he was the spy, that they just showed his dead body and we were maybe supposed to think he was killed by the others. But anyway, I guess it doesn't really matter. I think there's a secondary reason why. I mean, fuck, man, we only watched these episodes recently. How do we not remember how much is revealed about Goodwin? But I do have a theory that if we do know Goodwin is the spy upon the revolution of his name here, a revelation of his name, (laughs) I have a feeling it's going to actually serve some sort of a purpose as the episode goes on Mm -hmm. and to do something else. We'll discuss it later. So Lucia introduces herself too, and then we cut to a lovely fire that they have burning later on. 
Uh, Bernard is sitting by the fire. He's looking shook. So is everyone. But he looks particularly like just super upset. He stands up and he approaches Mr. Echo. Uh, he knows Mr. Echo was pulling the bodies out of the water earlier. And he asks him if he found any African-Americans. Mr. Echo replies, no. The diversity in the pasture demographics was lacking, apparently. No African-Americans in there. Which is actually quite surprising. Yeah. I would have expected at least a few. Yeah, large black population in Los Angeles. I don't know how often they go to Australia, I guess. Well, they're all coming from Sydney. <laughs> Anywho, Bernard says he can't find his wife, and Mr. Echo says he will pray for her. Hashtag thoughts and prayers. <laughs> Bernard asks where the rescue planes are. Mr. Echo says he will pray for them too. And it's weird because he seemed so useful all day with the bodies and the kids, and now he's just this. Ah, uh, listen, the man's paid his... <laughs> Dues on day one, okay? Get, cut him some fucking slack. He's allowed to relax. You know, us any excuse to religion bash. Bernard can only sort of whimper in response. You know, he's he's this is heartbreaking. You know, he he really he thinks his wife. I don't think he's got the same faith that Rose had that he was alive. Do you know what I mean? Like he's he's pretty worried. No, Rose was dead set. Like she knew. She didn't yeah. suspect. She didn't have a good guess. She knew it in her bones. Mm -hmm. We cut to later that night and the tailies are all sleeping. And suddenly there's the sound of a struggle, like muffled voices and sort of, you know, I don't know, maybe flesh hitting flesh and stuff like that. Maybe some punches. Just the, the, sounds of a, the sounds of a scuffle. Exactly. And this wakes some people up and Goodwin immediately grabs a shtick and he sets the end on fire, making a torch to go and investigate. Him and Anna Lucia run towards the noise they jump through like some overgrowth and they find Mr. Echo covered in blood and standing over two bodies that are dressed in rags. And we know these outfits. These are others uniforms and a big fucking rock in his hands. Like, yeah, what a beast. Yeah, it's wild. Yeah. So, so the way they reveal that is, is quite grim because Alan C asks him what happened. And Echo has this very disturbed look on his face. And then the camera pans down to yeah, this massive rock in his hand and it's covered in blood. He, he's blood soaked, too. We fade to black. Day two. Mr. Echo. Standing in silence, just staring at the ocean, and his shirt is still blood soaked. Like, there's it was a white shirt, it's not a white shirt anymore. And Lucy and a few extras are examining the bodies. Uh, Mr. Echo turned into corpses, and and Lucia expresses frustration. She says they have no identifying items on them, no wallets, no ID, no nothing. Mr. Echo, not far away, uh, removes his bloody shirt and he throws it to the ground. And like, he's within shouting distance of Anna Lucia. She asks him if he's okay. But he says nothing. Suddenly, an unnamed Taylor shows up and tells the group that three of the survivors are missing. They're unaccounted for. Three of the, the Taylors that survived the crash yesterday. Mr. Echo, all the while, grabs a shtick and he begins pulling off the excess branches and twigs. And he's getting a start on his artisanal island melee weapons business. This is the first one. Uh, and Anna Lucia concludes that the two freshly dead bodies here, they were here on the island before them. That's a pretty big assumption to make, but I guess where else do these cunts come from? You know, as you said, like, yeah, no shoes, no wallet. They're wearing potato sacks, no shirt, no shoes, but they still got service. They fucking kidnapped three of them. They got serviced by Echo. <laughs> uh, so shortly after that, Anna Lucia is co holding court and she tells the group they need to get off the beach and find a safer spot. Uh, the unnamed Taylor before that alerted her to the to the three missing bodies. I've been he calling protests. him farm boy because <laughs> he, he looks like he works on a farm. He does. He does. We actually learn his name in this scene, but we can keep calling him farm boy if you want. So he protests. He says they have kids, injured folk. Where the fuck are they even going to go? And how are they going to get rescued? They got to keep the fire burning. Goodwin chimes in. He agrees. He says Nathan's right. So our farm boy's name is Nathan. And Lucia says, you know, they got satellites and shit now. They don't need we don't need a fire to be found. But Cindy objects, confirming that the pilot says they had lost communication and that they were turning back, flying for two hours in the wrong direction. We remember the losties being informed of this by the pilot. They don't know where they're looking. Nobody knows where they are. Yeah. Nathan stares daggers at Anna Lucia. And frankly, she is stumped. This is a really good reason for Cindy to have survived, just to be able to give them that information, because how else Absolutely. would they get it? Yeah, yeah, this is great, because the Losties had the pilot. You know, these guys need an Oceanic staff member, basically. 
Day three, we see the Taley camp. They're scavenging whatever food they can from, you know, they're eating shellfish. They're digging in jacket pockets, etc. cetera. They're, they're doing a sweep, basically. Is it just me or is there a whole ton of them playing with rocks? Yeah, they're like baiting into shells and stuff. I don't know, to get edibles from them. I'm I honestly sure. thought they were trying to move a bunch of rocks into a SOS formation on the beach, kind of, you know, castaway style. Yeah, I mean, solid guess, but nothing comes of that. No. Uh, Libby approaches Anna Lucia and she tells her that Donald's leg is fucked. Donald, we learn, is the name of the dude who she, uh, you know, told her skiing story to earlier. His leg is fucked and that he's probably going to die. And Anna Lucia very coldly responds. Lol, what do you want me to do about it? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. What are we supposed to do about that? Sort of, I guess this this is a very brief scene. We get to day five after this, but this this kind of establishes her no bullshit personality from here on out, her cold leadership. Yeah, well, I mean, I thought that this was a mirroring of Jack uh, in the early days of season one, where people were coming to him as the de facto leader. And he was like, wait, what? Right. When was this decided? Sorry. When was I leader? You know, so this is Ana Lucia going like, like the fuck are you coming to me about this for? Like, yeah, she, like, she, she's not refusing the call to leadership, but she's, uh, you know, questioning it. Yeah. Uh, so day five and Donald is indeed dead and the Tailies bury him. Ana Lucia comforts the kids while Libby looks on in devastation. She just, she looks, she's not taking it well. All I have in my notes for day five is Donald dies. <laughs> That's yeah, it's, it. it's it's a very brief scene Mr. Echo is still shirtless And he stares at the sea If I looked like him I'd be shirtless a lot of the fucking time too Dude is cut He looks good Day 7, we're here a week And in contrast to the Somberness of the previous scene This scene made me laugh out loud when it started Because the dailies are all Chasing and trying to corner a fucking Chicken <laughs> <laughs> it's and it's the way it's shot. It's just missing like the Dukes of Hazard escape music. You yeah. Know, it's yeah. Like, hey, come on, get that chicken now, boy. <laughs> <laughs> and then Goodwin like very overly dramatically catches it, and he's like, "No, no, no I got it, I got it." And, like, but it's like on. someone else had it, but he wants the credit. Where did this fucking chicken come from? I don't remember the other survivors ever coming across I ha- chickens. Yeah, I have no fucking idea. Did it escape from the others camp, maybe? Like, is it left over from the Dharma initiative? Who the fuck knows? Anyway, it's it's pretty hilarious. Goodwin, like I said, he's he overly dramatically tries to take credit for catching it, even though someone else totally had it. And he breaks its neck. And then we cut to a fucking delicious looking rotisserie chicken cooking oh, over the fire. Man, that I made wanted me some of hungry. This. That shit was falling off the bone. Like, it looked delicious. You got your white meat, your dark meat. It was, it looked as good as something you get in Duns. No, man, I'll tell you, there's a Duns here, and I'm sorry to shout them out. There's a Duns here on the corner of Exchequer Street and Georgia Street. Anyone in Dublin, they know the one. You go in there and you see the fucking rotisserie chicken. It looks fucking manky because you know it's been there for like, I don't know, about as long as these tailies all survive on the island. Mm-hmm. That's how long it's been there, like a month and a half, or at least it looks it, right? I've never seen one that's that appealing. It looks delicious. This is island fried chicken. I mean, it's not fried, but IFC. Uh, Echo is still sitting on his own. He seems to be in a sort of self-imposed exile. He's etching some words into his shtick, and Libby approaches him and offers him some chicken, and he says nothing. And she notes that that's sort of been his vibe for a week now because he hasn't said a word since he killed those two others, essentially. Mate, that is how you know that this is entirely fictional. Let's say for whatever reason, I decided to take a self-imposed vow of silence for 40 days. Go on. Let's imagine I decided to do that. Impossible. Or even a week. Let's say I imagined to do it a week. If I just chose to not say another word for a week, my girlfriend would leave me within about two or three days. There would be all kinds of arguments. I'd be getting screaming in my face. Why won't you talk to me? It wouldn't like I wouldn't be able to get away with, you know, responding to questions with just a, a glower or you know, <laughs> just a, just a look and, you know, to look off in the distance full of ennui. You know, I wouldn't be allowed to get away with that shit. It'd be like, no, why aren't you talking? You're fully capable of speech. Say something, motherfucker. Yeah, I mean, these people have recently experienced a traumatic event. Maybe that's doing a lot for Mr. Echo's 
you know the the goodwill he's got with the group like Libby's a clinical psychologist you know it's 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 common enough for someone to experience a traumatic event and then not speak for a while right maybe she's chalking it up to that yeah maybe like that's entirely true although then again he was fucking speaking when he got to the island so yeah maybe the the initial shock hadn't set in anyway uh we do find out you know later on why he does it but uh Echo keeps up the silent treatment. So Libby calls on the most important thing she learned in clinical psychology class. When in doubt, quote, goodwill hunting. She said, it wasn't your fault. It wasn't your fault. Man. It's not your fault. And I think I think here she is implying that Echo has taken this vow of silence because he killed the two others. Right. So Libby is pretty tuned in to what's going on with him. Echo, of course, neither confirms nor denies. That's why he's taken a vow of silence. Day 12. And we skipped ahead five days now. The Tailies are partaking in their favorite pastime, which is sitting around doing fuck all. And like, I was thinking here, you know, no wonder these guys appear more feral than all the losties because not only are they like more terrorized by the others and stuff, they don't have the home comforts. They're all just fucking bored. That would drive yeah. anyone nuts. They have nothing to do. Like the Losties had fucking golf. They had a fuselage to dig through. They had lock going on hunts. And there stuff were like caves. That. Sun was digging a garden. Like it's really difficult to to feel like this much time is actually passing. You know these title cards of day five, day seven, day twelve. They feel kind of arbitrary. Like the show is just forcing time along without actually reflecting it in the actions of the characters. Yeah. But I guess, again, the implication is that there really isn't a lot for them to do. They're staying put on the beach. They're keeping the fire burning. And again, they, I mean, I don't know. I was going to say they feel like the jungle is more unsafe. The Losties were faced with a fucking monster. And they still like went out and explored and stuff like that. But anyway. uh, they had all kinds of weird shit happening. They had Christian, you know, a dead man walking around the beach. They had polar bear. They had monster. Like they had all kinds of weird ass mm-hmm. shit. These guys now... The main losties, they had a random polar bear in the jungle. These fuckers had a chicken. <laughs> well, all I got to say to that is, Tailies, there's a reason you didn't make main cast, you know? You should have been more interesting. Anywho, Anna Lucia is, is keeping herself busy. She's making a tool, and she tells Goodwin that she thinks she heard a pig or something, and she's dreaming of bacon for breakfast. And she looks forlornly over at the kids, and she's probably thinking of eating them. Uh, and Goodwin smiles. She questions him on this. You know, she goes, what? And they're interrupted by Nathan, who says he was off having a shite. And Anna Lucia is not happy. She's like, you were gone. You know, we have a system for that. We go in pairs. And this, I think this tells us a little bit about how the Tailies have been spending these, these days we didn't see, is that they've been regimented about staying within each other's sights. You know, Anna Lucia says we have a system. So they've probably just been coordinating on how they're going to live, how they're going to survive, how they're going to make sure that none of them go missing. And I guess that's something the Losties didn't have to deal with, is that none of their numbers went missing. They weren't abducted until Claire was. But by then, they, they knew about Ethan and the others. Exactly. Whereas these guys were literally attacked day one. And you'd wonder why. I guess you wouldn't know. Anyway, Nathan gives a flimsy apology, but there's clearly like a tension building between him and Anna Lucia. That night, the fires burn as the tailies all sleep, with no one on lookout, might I add. Like... Surely if they're regimented about taking Jack's breaks together, they should have had someone, they should have someone looking out at night, right? Now, here's the thing. Did they have someone on lookout and they were taken? Ooh, that is possible. Because just jumping ahead a little bit, we it is revealed that quite a number of people were taken in this raid. Yeah, so we do. We pan across the camp and we land on, a, you know, everybody's sleeping and then we land on a the legs of a group of others who are watching them all sleep. Yeah, a few barefoot bobs stalking through the camp. And they immediately begin to grab people. The strength of these people, like they're just lifting cunts out of their beds, fully grown adults. Although they do start with the kids. They grab the kids first. Anna Lucia gets up as Libby freaks out about the kids being taken. Anna begins to give chase, but is tackled by someone who we later learn is an other. Uh, she scraps with her mystery opponent. She gets her hands on a rock and she whacks the other upside the head, Mr. Echo style. Although this one much cleaner. Yeah, that was a nice uh, pistol whip. And by pistol, I mean fucking rock. <laughs> Goodwin and Libby approach Anna Lucia uh, with an incomplete status report. They say an undetermined number of folks have been taken, but no one has any idea which way they went, which again seems unlikely, but 
I don't know. This is the other's home turf, I guess. Anna Lucia shakes the other that she's just knocked the fuck out trying to get her to wake up. But she didn't knock her the fuck out. She actually killed her. She did. Anna begins looting the body and she finds a knife and a scrap of paper. Ooh. She unfurls the paper and informs the rest of the group that it's a list of nine members of the Taylor group. The exact nine that were taken. Mr. Echo arrives back and he grunts in a way that says, I didn't find anything. Um, Anna Lucia questions him further and grows frustrated when Echo continues his silence. Nathan tells her to settle down. And this goes about as well as you expect it to. Yeah. A man telling a woman to calm down. <laughs> Pro tip. Don't ever do that. Yeah. <laughs> we've, I think we've, we've touched on this before. Oh, yeah. Anna Lucia tells him that the list had the names and descriptions of the nine people taken. And she suspects there's a fucking rat in their ranks. There's a mole. Nathan is skeptical. He thinks maybe they could be getting the info from those who were already taken or maybe that they're being watched. And Lucia asks Nathan where he went for two hours yesterday. And Nathan has become suspect number one. So it makes you wonder why weren't the main survivors attacked like this? Because there was a lot more in their number. Yeah. Or is that possibly the reason why they, you know, strengthen numbers and all that? These were easier pickings because there's less of them. Could have been. It could have been that Jack had a great idea going to the caves. Maybe the others couldn't have flanked them as well. Yeah, with good point. Cover. Anyway, just before an argument erupts between Anna Lucia and Nathan, Goodwin cools the situation. He says they're all scared. Bernard agrees. He wonders why the others would even bother infiltrating the tailies. Libby says either way, they got to pack up and leave the beach. Anna Lucia turns this on Goodwin. He's, she's like, oh, you, I thought you said we should keep the fire, the signal fire burning. But he thinks it's time to let it go out. And Lucia stares back at Nathan with a look that says, Jacques. Yeah, she is on to him. Whether or not he deserves to be, you know, ha- he deserves to have this level of sub- suspicion leveled against him. Anna Lucia suspects Nathan is fucking shifty. And I'll stand up for Anna Lucia here. Nathan's not helping his situation with his fucking attitude. No, he's not. He is like literally. Be- like digging his own grave here. Day 15. And the tailies are traipsing. Uh, by now, it seems to just be our core crew of characters that we later come to learn left, plus Cindy, Goodwin, and Nathan. All red shirts have been taken in the in the latest Others attack. That is a nice handy way for the writers to get rid of them. They were abducted. Yeah. <laughs> and Lucy is fully calling the shots now. She tells everyone they can rest for five minutes by a river, and Nathan stares very resentfully at her. While Bernard complains, they've been traipsing for three days straight. You're still here, and Lucia counters. Nathan tells her she can fuck off if she wants to, but he's staying put. They got fresh water there. They got rocks to their back. They got plenty of fruit trees. And it's not a bad point. Like, what is Anne Lucia's end game? Is she just going to walk? I'm like, who knows? Explore the island, see if there's better cover somewhere, somewhere better for them to set up camp. Maybe find where the others came from, launch an attack. Like, who knows what she's thinking? True, and the moment is a tense one, but I guess Anna Lucia goes through the same thought process we did because yeah. she agrees. She's like, all right, fuck it, this'll do. Day 17. And Anna Lucia is digging what looks to be a trench or something. We later learn it's the uh, the tiger pit that she would later throw Sawyer and the boys into, the rafties. Uh, Libby approaches and she mentions Nathan's earlier disappearance the day of the other's attack where he took his two-hour jacks break. She says she's creeped out by it. She asks Anna if it's possible that one of us is one of them. Yeah. I mean, their heads are in the right place here. 100%. Why do you think I'm digging this hole? Anna replies. Day 19. And Nathan and Bernard are setting what looks to be like a rabbit trap. Uh, Anna Lucia approaches. Bernard gives her a cheery hello. And she gives Nathan a cheery kick in the face. That is a mighty fucking wallop right there. I mean... You kick someone like where on his face did she make contact? Was it sole of the foot to the nose? Was it toe to the chin? Depending on how she hit him, she could have done some serious damage. Yeah, she could have broken a nose or a jaw or anything. But we're used to this in Lost by now. You know, like people going way overboard with the violence to virtually no long term effect. Right. (laughs) Uh, so she carries him back to the pit and tosses him in, christening it with its first prisoner. Nate's what the fuck she's doing. She says they're going to have a little talk and then completely reneges on that promise, closes him in, leaving him on his own. Uh, she gathers the other tailies and she tells him that Nathan wasn't on the plane. 
She didn't see him, to which Goodwin tries to call bullshit. But then Cindy backs Ana Lucia up. Yeah. Which is interesting. Because if anyone's going to know, it's flight attendant Cindy, right? Yeah. And she's all like, I'm good with faces and shit. And I don't remember him from the plane. So it was at this moment that we, the audience, became proper suspicious. Yeah. Like, okay. Okay. And we don't like Nathan anyway. He has been a dick. And this is why I feel like it's not the worst move to reveal who Goodwin is early in the episode. Because we don't really give a shit about him. We know he's shifty. What's the deal with this Nathan dude? Our focus yeah. is on him. Is he a number two, maybe? Yeah. Goodwin, speaking of, continues to protest. But Libby says that Nathan never talks about himself. He's constantly dodging personal questions. Bernard is skeptical, clearly showing that it's boys against girls here. Anna Lucia asks Mr. Echo if he's got a problem with how she's handling things. And true to his recent form, he says, fuck all. Yeah. Uh, that night, Anna approaches the pit with a torch. She opens the cage door and she asks Nathan where the kids are. He says nothing. After a couple of more attempts at the same question, she changes tact and asks him where he's from. Nathan says he's from Canada. Shout out here right now, which is immediately sus. You know, that's where that's traditionally where American teenagers say they kissed a girl from when they haven't kissed anyone. Yeah, she goes to another school. You wouldn't know her. <laughs> she asks him what he was doing in Australia. He says... He was on a company retreat, but that the rest of the company weren't on the plane because he stayed a couple of extra days for some sightseeing. And like, dude, defend yourself better. I think it's a matter of pride with Nathan at this point, right? Because he doesn't yeah. want to like validate her suspicions. And yet he's doing nothing to help his case. Yeah. I mean, if you're innocent, you would be telling people you're innocent. Mm hmm. But yeah, it's the, the spite's getting the better of him. And it tells him that nobody saw him on the plane. He said he was in the jacks. And that he didn't see her on the plane either. Now, this would actually line up with this dude having bowel problems. Because if he had to remain in the jacks on the plane for the, the whole flight, then yeah, sure. He's uh, going to be off for two hours trying to take a shit. This go. man is without his fucking constipation meds or something. I don't know. That could be it. Yeah, okay. Now, now see, suspicion is starting to wait again. It's probably a good one. Uh, yeah, so he says, I didn't see, you know, they do a very childish, like, I didn't see you on the plane. I didn't see you on the plane. That's because you weren't on it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, day 23. Nathan's still in the pit, and Anna is still asking about the kids. And uh, Nathan has now taken a leaf out of Mr. Echo's book and is taking a vow of silence. And Lucy then notices something behind him. And she tells Nathan to get up. <laughs> and she throws a rock at him to sort of force him to move, right? And he gets up to reveal he's hiding a banana peel. Someone's been feeding them. Someone's been given the cunt food. We never actually do find out who, do we? Um, no, actually. It's never properly confirmed. Yeah. It could be any of them either because they it's sort of on brand for everyone at the tailies to do so. Except Anna Lucia. And she obviously thinks so as well because we cut to her questioning all of the tailies and she accuses Bernard outright who denies it. And the rest of the tailies now seem to be doubting that Nathan is a spy. You know, suddenly they're they're not so sure about their stories from before. You know, uh, Anna Lucia asks once again who gave him food. And Echo slowly walks up from behind her and he's essentially owning up. Oh, wait. So, yeah, we do kind of get the answer there, don't we? Yeah. Sorry, my bad. I forgot. <laughs> yeah. But isn't it funny how in Echo's silence here, his silence is so fucking loud. He yeah. says so much by not saying anything. Dude is nothing if not a presence. Yeah, he is just this presence. But Anna Lucia asking who gave him the food and, you know, Echo staring her down, basically saying non-verbally that he did it. He's telling her that I am not going to have another man's death on my hands. I am not going to be party to this fucking cruelty that you're putting this man through. He mm -hmm. says so much by not saying anything. That's that's acting. Yeah, that's fantastic. Him and Anna, like you said, he says nothing. They just stare at one another before he walks off. We cut to Anna alone by the river and she's having a drink of water. And Goodwin shows up and tells her the group is worried about her as she begins eating some kind of fruit. She's like peeling it with the knife and stuff, cutting off bits of it. Goodwin points out that she's had Nathan prisoner for four days. And Lucia responds that she promised the little girl that she would get her back to her mom. Big fucking promise to make. Goodwin asks if she has any kids. She hesitates and then says no. 
Goodwin then says they should just let Nathan go, that they're not savages. And Alicia basically is like, you want to see Savage? I'm going to I'm gonna cut that fool's finger off tomorrow. Yeah, if we were savages, I'd have cut his finger off already. But because I'm not a savage, I'm saving it till tomorrow. <laughs> like, all right, cool, that adds up. Uh, she walks away, leaving Goodwin looking pretty frustrated. And that night, Nathan's cage is opened and a rope is lowered in. The reverse shot reveals that it's fucking Goodwin. He pulls Nathan up, hands him a nicely wrapped bundle of food. A little too well wrapped. Do you what know do you what mean by like too well wrapped? I don't know. That looks like a, a lunchbox you'd only learn to make if you were native to a, a certain island. Oh, <laughs> I see. And uh, she tells Nathan, you're not safe here without a Lucia around. You got to get the fuck out of Dodge. Nathan's like, okay, well, which way is the beach? I liked it there. Goodwin points him in the direction right behind him. Nathan begins to take off. And after about two steps, Goodwin grabs him and breaks the cunt's neck. That is savage right there. But why? Well, and Lucia asks him later on. So let's wait. Okay, moving on. Day 24. Yep. Anna Lucia wakes up and just has a fine morning for finger chopping. She rolls over and Goodwin is like lying near her, uh, like a like a one night stand regret. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? He's like, oh up my on god, his, up on his elbow, hand head resting in his hand. He's like, hey, good morning, good morning, sweetheart. <laughs> Did you have any nice dreams? <laughs> but she doesn't seem faced at all. Like she's she's like, hey, what's up? And then suddenly Libby runs into the camp. And he tells her that Nathan is gone. The Tailies and Goodwin all approach the pit and see it for themselves. Bernard asks, what are we going to do now? Anna Lucia says, well, we've been found. It's time to move on. Yes, it is time to bounce the fuck out of Dodge. Day 26. And the Tailies are traipsing on. And everyone, except Anna Lucia and Goodwin, funny enough, they all just look so fed up. They look tired. And Lucia is determined she won't, you know, she won't break. Goodwin is an other, so he's obviously not that tired. Um, well, I mean, something that's worth keeping in mind here now is that it's nearly been an entire month since they crashed on this island. They haven't had a moment's rest. Absolutely. Really and truly. They emerge from the woods and they're back on the beach. And that's pretty much all that happens this day. Well, they're not really on, on the beach, are they? They're more like at the shore. It's not, it's not a sandy beach, is it? Nah, I guess, yeah, it's pretty small. It's nothing nothing like the Lost East Beach, anyway. Day 27 opens on a shot of a wooden door that's just, like, in the side of a bunch of leaves and shit. And uh, it looks like the tailies have stumbled across the tail hole. That is so unfair. That is so unfair. <sighs> we'll get to it. Go on. Go on with the scene. I'll talk about it in a bit. Please do, because I don't know what you mean. Is it that the Lost has got a a hatch that nearly drove Locke over the edge, whereas they just get a door. Yeah, they get a door that they can just fucking open. <laughs> whereas we spent 20 odd fucking episodes watching Locke fucking smear fucking juju paste on people <laughs> and blowing it up with dynamite and going crazy shamanistic bullshit. Like he was this close to wearing his underpants on his head, chanting around it, dancing on, oh, yeah, you know, doing fucking whatever to get that shit open. These guys find a door. It's pretty funny. I mean, I mean, we knew the tail hole was going to show up eventually, and it shows up with such little fanfare. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And Alicia reckons it's some kind of bunker. Even Goodwin looks a little bit surprised to find it. Yeah. Showing that, you know, the others, they're natives to this item, but they don't know every fucking nook and cranny of it. But this is day 27. Day 26, they arrived at the shore. Mm-hmm. Exactly where they wanted to go. Day 27, they're all in the jungle again. What yeah. happened? I mean, I guess they're doing ranges in to find to forage food and stuff like that. Yeah, a bit of reconnaissance. Having said that, I did have a funny image of like Goodwin running from the other's camp to to join the Tailies as an infiltrator, and he just bombs it right past this door <laughs> without even <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> without even noticing it. So Mr. Echo elbows his way to the front of the pack and he approaches the door wrenches it open and we get a shot from inside to reveal the word quarantine written on the inside of the where door. have just, we seen this before just like the hatch no dynamite required this time they enter this dank bunker torches aloft and we see the dharma logo on the wall and this one instead of a swan it's got an arrow through the word dharma this will come to be known as the arrow station 
Does it rise to any significance in the show later on, or is this pretty much all we get of it? Uh, no, in fact, skipping ahead to my trivia, this is the last appearance of the Arrow in the entire show. Oh, well, there you go. Goodwin opines that the place looks like a storage facility. He's probably right. You know, it doesn't seem to be any more significance than that. And Lucia finds a fuse box that actually turns on a few lights, and she's happy out. She also finds a crate, which they pull open, and inside, covered in blankets, are various trinkets, presumably some fishing nets, because we see them with fishing nets later on. Uh, but there's also a Bible. Lost invented the loot crate. <laughs> <laughs> this is like Resident Evil shit here. They find a Bible, a glass eye, and a radio. And a radio. Yeah, there's only a couple of quest items in there. The rest is uh, this glass junk. eye. You know that this glass eye fits into like the eye socket of a statue somewhere to reveal a <laughs> hidden door to the next part of the level, right? <laughs> if Resident Evil has taught me anything, the only notable thing here is that Mr. Echo takes a sort of immediate interest in the Bible. You know, he grabs it and he's flicking through it. And Lucia looks delighted. But Goodwin looks unsure about the situation. None of them are questioning the source of the electricity. And I find that a little weird. Yeah. But I guess they don't know a whole lot about the natives either. So who knows? True. They're pretty open minded at this stage. We cut to some tailies out in the open uh, later that day. And Bernard pulls the antenna out the radio. He turns it on and they hear static. Bernard speaks into the radio asking if anyone can hear him. Goodwin grabs it. And he tells them the hills are blocking the signal. We need to get to higher ground. And then he volunteers to go. Again, we've heard this before, right? This was yeah. uh, pretty much what happened with our losties as well. And Lucia says she'll join him. And he tells her, nah, 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 you stay here. Get the place set up as a shelter. Plenty of time for that later, dog, says Anne Lucia. And Goodwin has nothing to say in response. He just smiles nervously. I mean, this is where he gives away the game, right? This is where Anna gives away her game. Yeah, she's coming with him. She's not letting him out of her mm -hmm. sight with that radio. When do you think the suspicion began? I don't know. That's what I was going to ask in the next scene, right? Because, OK, hold on. Cards on the table. Anna suspects him. How long has she been suspecting him? This is the thing. When exactly does the penny drop for her? I guess she's got to think that maybe... I mean, she never did question too much who let Nathan out of the cage, right? Yeah, true. She just says, we got to go. Maybe she had made up her mind right there and then. Maybe something tipped her off. Yeah, I guess. Maybe it was the creepy way that Goodwin woke her up. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's not human. <laughs> so we cut to the, to the pair of them. They're traipsing up the hill. And Anna Lucia asks Goodwin what he thinks the other's motivations are in attacking them. And Goodwin takes umbrage with the word attack. Again, dude, <laughs> like what is wrong with him on this day, day 27? Like he's just he's just fucking playing his hand, you know, showing his hand left and right. But yeah, he takes umbrage with the word attack, saying that it might not necessarily be what they're doing. They're abducting, sure. But are they attacking? She then asks why they take some and not others. Goodwin reckons they took the strongest the first night. You know, like the strongest, the most capable. Hence the attempted capture of Mr. Echo. They wanted to neutralize the threats early. Right. They didn't take you, Anna says. And Goodwin reckons they changed their plan after they had two casualties, after Echo fucked two others up. Weak defense, but okay. Yeah, like I said, he's, 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 his story is crumbling here. He then proposes a break, to which Anna agrees. They sit down, and Goodwin asks for the knife, then shows her a mango. And Anna is clearly fucking sus of him at this point, right? She does not want to hand this guy a knife. But she obliges him nonetheless. And then Anna asks how the others got their hands on a U.S. military standard issue army knife when they don't even wear shoes. Oh, man, this is so funny. <laughs> yeah, I thought this was hilarious. This was hilarious. Right? <laughs> I watched this with my buddy that I'm staying with right now. We both laughed at this. So. Goodwin's like, what do you mean, U.S. Army? And she gets the knife back off of him and explains the reason she knows it's a U.S. Army knife is because the words U.S. Army are etched on it in massive fucking block letters. <laughs> it would have been like so much better if there was like a mysterious series of numbers on it. And she explained, yeah. oh, this is a serial number. Ones that begin with this number are from this era in the military. The blah, Vietnam blah, blah. War, my grandma's right. there, whatever. Yeah, like, nah, but no, but, I mean, big she... letters stamped <laughs> on the blade. U.S. Army. <laughs> US. So stupid. She does seem to have some knowledge, though, because she knows the knife to be at least 20 years old, right? She knows the era. 
from which it's from at least. And then she asks Goodwin how he found Bernard up in the tree on the day of the crash. Anna Lucia has got the knife again. Yeah. And it wasn't difficult. So she's asking the questions now. She's wearing the pants. He says he heard him from the beach. Anna repeats this. And Goodwin, he knows what's up now. He asks why he's being probed. Anna asks if Bernard seeing him out there was the reason why Goodwin pretended to be one of them. Yeah, and there we go. Cards are on the table. He says nothing. So she continues her case. He wasn't wet like the rest of them. He had never even been in the ocean. I did have a thought here as well. So uh, everyone landed in the ocean except Bernard. No way that Goodwin could have just landed in the jungle dry. Except for the fact that that's exactly what happened to Jack Shepard. Right. Now, they don't know that that's what happened to the main <laughs> No, survivors. of course. But, but I mean, <laughs> this is this is a bullshit line of questioning. I mean, she knows he's an imposter, but mm-hmm. the question she's asking is bullshit, like confronting with the evidence of you weren't even wet. Well, he could have said neither was Bernard. Yeah. <laughs> now, like I said, Bernard maybe had the defense that he was in his chair. And so that's why he didn't die when he landed in the jungle. But again, neither did Jack Shepard. Right. So and he had no chair. Anywho. And Lucia asks what he did to, with Nathan. Okay, so here's where Goodwin explains why he did this. He says if he had kept up his story even after losing a finger, she might have begun to suspect that he wasn't an other after all. Right. Which is... So was he an other? Well, apparently not. No. But, I mean, if he was an other, wouldn't he have kept up his story after losing a finger? Right. Although, then again, if any, I mean, it's the Chinese. If the Chinese have proven anything, it's that people will confess to anything under sufficient amounts of torture. There you go. Well, the Chinese and the Russians. He then says, very interestingly, that Nathan, quote, was not a good person. I hate this line. That's why he wasn't on the list. Absolute cock. I, I hate this line because I feel like it's the show just trying to be mysterious. For the sake of being mysterious, like this is pure betrayal of the fact that the show writers weren't 100 percent sure where they were going with these others. They just Mm -hmm. wanted them to be these mysterious wild men that lived in the woods. Yeah. Although they seem to be putting them in a position of moral judgment here, like they, you know, right. Setting something up like that. But yeah, you're right. I mean, I don't know. I don't know that it really goes that way. Where does that go? That moral judgment of judging the survivors on whether they're good or not. The others, the, the whole mysterious angle they're going for with the others falls apart pretty quickly uh, once we meet them. Unless Goodwin is working directly for Jacob. Ooh, okay. Well, yeah, that could be it. There's a fucking late show reference. That could be it. And we do know Jacob is tied to the others in certain ways. So yeah, okay. There yeah. you go. I love when we answer our own questions. Anna Lucia then asks Goodwin if he killed the kids too. And he says the children are fine. In fact... They're better off now. And his shit eating grin, as he says this, is the last fucking straw for Anna Lucia. She leaps on him and they have a scrap. I won't I won't describe it in detail, apart from the key events, which is that Goodwin brandishes his pointy stick at one point, lunges at Anna Lucia with it, but she manages to, to disarm him, fucks it off the side of a hill. After a bit more scrapping, the two of them sort of follow suit down the hill. They tumble down together. Goodwin stops at one point where Anna Lucia falls down another ridge. <laughs> Goodwin's got the higher ground. And as he's about to fucking leap from the turnbuckle. <laughs> onto oh, my Anna, God. Like, whoa. <laughs> like, why was he doing oh, this? Oh, God, JR, from the top. Bro. <laughs> yeah, he was going to fucking he was going to do the, the flying elbow or whatever. This was some mankind hell in a cell <laughs> shit. <laughs> yeah. that, that fucking dive. But yeah, it's 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 unbelievable. It's ridiculous. Anna grabs the pointy stick, which she earlier threw off the edge and fucking impales the cunt. I feel like you're not doing enough justice to the pointy stick. That's borderline a fucking telephone pole that she's yeah. holding. That's like a big, solid thing, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, very sharply carved. Goodwin falls back. He's dead as fuck. I mean, he's nice and impaled. They could have had roast Goodwin for dinner that night. True. True. He's already got the spit through him. But anyway, Anna Lucia returns to the Taley camp. They ask after Goodwin, but she says, we'll be safe here now. And everyone gives a look like Anna Lucia ain't nothing to fuck with. Yeah, nobody questions further. Day 41. 
which is a two week jump in time. Our last day was day 27. So we have two weeks without incident here. Yeah. So presumably they've all been filled in at this stage. The tailies are out foraging while Bernard tries the radio. Anna Lucia asks him why he's wasting his time. And Bernard says, ah, relax. I only turn it on a couple of minutes a day. And suddenly a voice sounds from the radio. A very familiar voice. The voice on the other end says, we're the survivors of Oceanic Flight 815. And Bernard repeats this, revealing the voice to be Boone on the other end. No, we're the survivors of Oceanic 815. (laughs) This is the day that Boone dies. Bernard was the voice on the other end, though, as we learned in our trivia, he was not the actual voice in the airing of that episode because he hadn't been cast yet. Uh, Also, they do change the dialogue slightly here from the original episode. Oh, interesting. I read that. I didn't actually put it in my trivia. I just thought it would be fine to point out here. Yeah. The Tadies look confused, but Anna grabs the radio and turns it off, skeptically saying it's them. She reckons it's the others trying to lure them out, talking shite about Oceanic A15. Now, this is pure paranoia, but it's she 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 deserves a bit of paranoia. Yeah, it's it's educated paranoia. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Bernard asks, how did they know the number then? Because Goodwin knew, Alicia says, fair. Bernard asks, what if there are survivors? But Anna just won't hear it, saying, this is our life now. Get used to it. And Bernard and Mr. Echo stare at her in what looks to be resentment. That is a sad fucking life to be forced to... You know, like they're being told to resign themselves to this life. So mm-hmm. I can't blame them holding a little bit of resentment towards Anna here, even though it's not her fault. Of course not. And Lucia stalks off. We cut to her sitting alone by a river and we get a close up of her face and slowly but surely her tough exterior crumbles and she just lets it all out with a good cry. She has a wee little whinge to herself. Uh, it's a heartbreaking scene. And I, I feel really bad for her here. You know what I mean? She's put up the tough face for 41 fucking days now. She's the leader. And I think, you know, when she said, this is our life now, get used to it. Like she was telling Bernard to resign himself to it. But I guess this is her resigning herself to it and just being fucking upset about it. Like she sees no way forward, no way out. Yeah. I, like they've just been through so much. She's bottled it all up to maintain that tough exterior that, you know, something's got to give. Enough yeah. pressure builds up in a bottle, it can burst. But that's what we're watching. It's heartbreaking, like I said. And suddenly, Mr. Echo shows up. Creeping it real. And she asks, what are you looking at? And he finally speaks. He says, it's going to be okay. He approaches her, comes closer, and she says, what, you talking now? And Echo replies that it's been 40 days. And... Listeners and viewers who grew up in Ireland or with a religious upbringing will know that 40 days was the amount of time What that, that Jesus exiled himself in the desert without food and water, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's the book of Matthew. Jesus goes walking the desert 40 days, 40 mm-hmm. nights. And fucking Satan shows up and says, for fuck's sake, would you ever have a sandwich? You know, <laughs> starving yourself. Yeah, it's 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 a very biblical reference. Yeah, it's sort of the, the biblical, traditionally Christian, like time of penance, right? Lent is also 40 days long. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a significant number to Christianity. We saw Echo take interest in the Bible earlier. There's, there's some religious shit going on here. And I would have a lot more empathy for... Anna Lucia here in this scene, except for the fact that Michelle Rodriguez is a shit crier on screen. <laughs> Do you think? I think she's so terrible. She's so unconvincing. Not a single tear. Mm. Not one. She just kind of scrunches up her face. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, fuck me. Anyone can do that. Try acting. I bet Michelle Rodriguez has never cried in her life. She strikes me as that kind of person. <laughs> Tough as nails. So like I said, he says it's been 40 days. You waited 40 days to talk, asks Ana Lucia. And Echo counters with, you waited 40 days to cry. Oh, that's a good counter. I like it. It's a touching moment. She breaks down again. She snuggles up to the big, burly teddy bear that Whoa. is Mr. Echo. It looks like a lovely little hug. Lovely little cuddle. Day 45. Now is when shit gets real. Yeah, we haven't got long left here, folks. We'll bull through this. Cindy and Libby are attempted to fish with a net. Again, presumably they just found it in the arrow, right? Uh, when Cindy spots something up the beach, a person washed ashore. They run up. 
They turn the man over. It's our boy, Jin. Yeah. Libby tells Cindy to get Anna Lucia as Jin begins to cough up water. We cut to Jin, blindfolded and tied to a tree. Mr. Echo pokes him lightly with a stick, then lifts the blindfold, and Jin looks freaked. Echo asks who he is and where he's from, and Jin responds in Korean. Do you know what he says? No. Okay. I don't have it either, but he does end with a hearty sort of, huh? You feel lucky, punk? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> so we cut to the tailies and they're sort of debating the crack with Jin, you know, what they should do with them. Bernard and Cindy mention how he doesn't speak English, but Anna counters with the fact that he's got a broken handcuff on his wrist. Echo joins the group and he offers his two cents. He says he doesn't think Jin is a threat. And Jin, the owl legend, manages to break the, the skinny tree that he's tied to and he begins fucking pegging it. And the tailies give chase. And it's from here where we get a repeat of some footage from episodes two and three of this season. Cue the drums and slow-mo footage. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. I guess it works. Yeah. So Jin finds Sawyer and Michael on the beach. The tailies whoop their asses and they're all tossed in the pit. And then we get the first new footage of this era where uh, we get Anna Lucia asking Mr. Echo to hit her. And he picks up on the plan without her saying anything. He obliges her. We get more montage of Anna Lucia being thrown into the pit, punching Sawyer, revealing her identity, which brings us to day 46. Drums and slow-mo footage continue. Yeah, all montage. The lads being pulled out of the pit, meeting the tailies in the tail hole. Day 47. More drums and slow-mo footage. On the move again. Sawyer's health problems, the stretcher. Cindy looking behind her and reminding us that she was nabbed. And then we get day 48 today. The tailies have just lost Cindy and it's fucking bucket and rain. The whispers fire up around them. It's a tense moment. And Lucia draws the gun. She's darting around for someone or something to point it at. Shannon emerges from the bushes and she fucking pops her. Bang. Right in the belly. Michael asks, what was that? And we get footage of Saeed in raging grief over Shannon's body. And that's all she wrote. We end on a dramatic, rainy shot of Anna Lucia lost. Boom. So we are now right back where we were at the end of the last episode. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Lovely. They love doing that. Uh, what did you think of the episode? I, I did the ending did feel very rushed, but I guess it kind of had to because they were just retreading all ground at that point. But what do you think overall? Overall, I mean, I'm I'm in two minds. Seventy five percent good, and of that good, I think this is such a fucking great direction to take the show with. This is a great idea for an episode. Yeah, for the show. Like, keep in mind when this was first being aired, there was so much loss hype after season one. That for them to come out and do an episode like this with none of the main characters, mm. like they felt confident enough to do something yeah. like this. They were they were experimenting with the format here, right? Right. Like this is uh yeah, it's all island, like no flashback. I think I think the episode suffered for that in a little way because it didn't get to do the sort of character study they usually do. I guess I guess a little bit with Anna Lucia with her breaking down and stuff like that, maybe with Mr. Echo as well. But you know, it was it was broad strokes for the rest. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we didn't get as in-depth a portrayal of any of the other tailies that we might have wanted. Maybe just Anna Lucia and Echo a little bit, like they explore Echo quite a bit, or at least the way he thinks. No flashbacks, which is a breath of fresh air. Or is it all flashbacks? Um, <laughs> I guess technically. Yeah. But it's island events, like, so whatever. But yeah, how they portrayed those last couple of days with the slow-mo footage with the drum soundtrack over it. I can't think how I would have done it better, but it still doesn't, it doesn't feel great. Yeah, I agree. It's a little bit lame. It was nice to get a barrage of answered questions. Like any questions we had about the tailies were all pretty much wrapped up here, right? Yeah, exactly. It was a bit of an answer fest and it kind of sweeps those questions aside so we can get on with the losty plot and integrate the tailies in without too much sidetracking. Yeah. Yeah, and that was one of the reasons I really liked it as well. Yeah, the episode certainly served its function. It was entertaining. It was, you know, good performances all around. I appreciated the experimentation with the format. Our boy Eric Lanouville did a great job directing. Uh, Yeah, solid episode. I mean, 
I, I remember loving this episode when I saw it the first time as a young man. I don't think I liked it quite as much this time. You know, so, some of the pacing felt a little bit rushed, but overall, I, I, I enjoyed it. Positive feelings. It was a nice uh, spin off, I guess. Yeah, 100%. Uh, now it's time for us to spin off into our trivia section. You ready for this, Edo? Oh, cue the music. Motherfucking hit that shit. All right, so like I said before, trivia section for this, not as meaty as I'd like it to be, but there you go. We, we got some stuff. This probably seems as obvious to most people, but this is the first episode not to feature Jack Shepard and Hugo Reyes, played by Matthew Fox and Jorge Garcia, who prior to this had been the only two cast members to have appeared in every episode. Wow. Okay, so Jack, yeah, I would have definitely said, yeah, he's been in every episode. But Hugo? Mm-hmm. Hurley's yeah. been in every app. In fact, like we haven't actually had a line of dialogue from Jack in a while because he only had the cameo on the last episode in Shannon's flashback. So Hurley has probably gotten like more recent character time on screen. That's true. I mean, I feel like they could have done with a shot of, you know, with Anna and Goodwin heading up into the hills to get signal. I feel like they could have done a cheeky shot of like, way off in the distance in the background of like Hurley playing golf or something that could have <laughs> that that could have been a thing I don't know if incredible. the timeline matches up but eh, it's fun to think about maybe they filmed something like that we can ask Jorge Garcia when he comes on this pod to drink some titties this is also the only episode of the entire series in which both Jack and Locke do not appear every other episode has at least one of them in it oh fuck this is the only in the whole series mm-hmm Bro, I find that so difficult to believe. But yeah, so every episode has either Jack or Locke in it, except this one. Man, that's correct. That's pretty wild. This is the first episode to not feature any flashbacks from before the plane crash, like we already pointed out. Yeah, I noticed that. By the time they reach the Losties camp, there are four tailies left. Numbers. Yeah, we do like a good number shoved in there every now and again. So here's an interesting one. The first killing of an other by an Oceanic 815 survivor happens in this episode. Mr. Echo, he kills the two that tried to kidnap him, meaning that the Oceanic survivors drew first blood. I never fucking realized that. Now, you could argue it's in self-defense. They were the ones that were attacked. And it's not like the others filled them in on what they were doing. Right. They didn't come with, you know, fruit baskets and shit and be like, hey, welcome to the <laughs> island. Can we borrow like nine of you just to come with us? We just want to, you know, do some tests, make sure you're all healthy and stuff. Totally in a non-suspicious way. Yeah, hopefully they'll reassess their methods after this. They've learned some things, you know. Right. Right after the plane, plane's tail crashes on the water, one of the monster sounds could be heard. We mentioned that earlier. And I'm convinced I heard a second one. In the episode Jughead all the way ahead in season five, or maybe it's four, four or five. It's revealed that the U.S. Army visited the island in the 1950s. This is likely the origin of the pocket knife Anna Lucia and Goodwin fight over in this episode. So it's never actually confirmed, but that's safe to assume, right? No, but that's a nice tie in. I I Mm -hmm. like that idea. Yeah, that's headcanon. Another one I said before, but just to remind you, this is the last episode to feature the arrow. The arrow station, or as we like to call it, the tail hole. Now, I do believe that the arrow is referred to again. Don't they find like parts of the missing swan video in the arrow? Maybe it's in a different station, but oh, maybe this is the last time we have seen it. There's a deleted scene in this episode. I like this bit of trivia. Uh, it shows the tail section survivors pulling a large parcel from the ocean. Zach and Emma, who are the kids, they really hope that food will be inside, but they're disappointed when the only thing inside are Australian boomerangs. Oh, <laughs> how fucking sickened would you be? Nice little uh, thing that connects it to the wider story here as well. The box that the boomerangs come from bears the emblem of Melbourne Walkabout Tours, the company Locke tried to go through for his walkabout. 
Oh, brilliant. That would have been a nice little wink. I think that scene is available on YouTube. Haven't actually confirmed that. Damn near all of the deleted scenes are available on YouTube, I've learned. That is it for my trivia, Edo, but are you ready for some goofs? Oh, please hit me. I love go- Oh, can I give you my own little bit of trivia? Oh, all right. Yeah, you got a trivia point, please. It is not related to the show, but it kind of is. So you're aware of the character that I have named Farm Boy because he looks like he works on a farm. Yes, Nathan. Yes. Nathan is played by an actor called Josh Randall, who, like our director, has appeared in an episode of Scrubs. He's actually appeared in four. Oh, no way. Yeah, he was the boyfriend of the character Elliot Reed. I knew he looked fucking familiar to me. I wonder, is that how he got the job? Like if Eric gave him a hand. It so confuses me because this actor, Josh Randall, he's only in one episode. All of the filming is done in Hawaii. Did he have to go all the fucking way out to Hawaii to film one damn episode? That's the life of a working TV actor. I just said, fuck that, man. If the studio were paying for me to go out to Hawaii for a week, I'm in. I mean, yeah, okay. If the studio is paying, then yeah, sure. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> they don't make you pay your own transport if it's a job. Surely not. I get a nice little holiday out of it. All right, time to goof it up. Uh, so at one point, Anna Lucia, when they're accusing a uh, farm boy of being the other, Anna Lucia says, we were in the air for two hours. I didn't see him, not once, which contradicts the pilot who said that they were in the air for at least six hours and then they changed course after six and were flying for two hours. Uh, so uh, Anna Lucia must have had a snooze. Yeah, I'd imagine so. She thought, you know, those naps where you think you've only been asleep for five minutes, but it's been five mm. hours. Those ones. To be fair, she was necking then tequilas in the airport beforehand as well. We saw that. That's a good point. She might not have been in her right mind. Anna Lucia says that Goodwin came to the crash site 10 minutes after they crashed. However, later in the episode, A Tale of Two Cities, Ben says that it'll take Goodwin an hour to get to the shore. So I think Anna Lucia just has a terrible sense of time. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Another goof here. When Goodwin and Anna Lucia are taking a break before their fight, at the top of a white car is visible driving in between them in the background from right to left. Bruh. Another little continuity error here. Goodwin dies in a different place than where Echo and Jin found him in the episode And Found. Uh, Echo and Jin find his corpse by the hillside, yet the first time we see him dead, it is inside the jungle. That is true. It is, you know, there are a lot more trees I remember the first time we find them, but this is kind of like how they spontaneously just changed the location of the hatch at one point in season one. Someone forgot to leave a rock where they filmed before. Final bit of goofiness here, and then we can wrap this shit up. The background tail section survivor, played by Julia Sumo, is one of the three tailies that died prior to Donald. However, she's briefly seen alive on day 12 after her death. Ooh. Oh, fucking zombie survivor. That was probably just the man in black hanging out, sussing them out. Ah, do you know what, actually? You can use actual lost lore to explain that. Mm-hmm. There Fuck you go. me. Well, that is it. You know, that's it for the goofs. That's it for the trivia. That is it for the episode. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. Ado, thanks for joining us with, well, with your sickness and all. We really appreciate it. It has been an absolute pleasure. Please check us out on social media at Lost the Pot Lads on everything. Check us out on Mother Flippin' Redbubble. Buy some merch. Shout out to Jimmy Purcell once again. Thank you so much for the artwork. Take a look at your device right now. Look at that beautiful artwork for this episode. Season two, baby. Please recommend us to a friend who likes Lost and a friend who doesn't. And uh, before we go, Edo, what is your theory this week? My theory this week is that this episode has finally cracked the answer on the age-old philosophical question. Why did a chicken cross the road? To get to this fucking island and get caught by Goodwin. <laughs> and then eaten. Well, you heard it here first, folks. Thanks again for listening. And remember, you haven't lost anything until you've lost the plot. Good night. Good night. Good night. Lost the Plot is produced by me and Edo. The artwork is by Jimmy Purcell of binbettercomic.com. 
The music is by Noel Brennan of No Exit. You can check out No Exit wherever you stream your music. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Lost Plot Lads, and you can email us at Lost Plot Lads. <laughs>